Good morning and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. My name is David Burton. Is Mike sir? Really? My name is David Burton and I'm Senior Fellow in Economic Policy here at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, uh, before, uh, well, let, let me remind everybody to silence their cell phones so that uh, we don't have any cell phones going off in the middle of the presentation. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to address a number of preliminary matters. Today's event is part of our series, Free Markets, The Ethical Economic Choice. This video and also uh, videos of all our previous events are available on the Heritage Foundation website, heritage.org forward slash free dash markets, or on the Heritage Foundation YouTube channel under events. After the speaker's presentation, we'll have time for some audience questions and answers. Our next event after today will be, will feature Samuel Gregg of the Acton Institute speaking on Tocqueville, Novak, and the Challenge of Socialism, and the event will be on May 29th. Our speaker today is James Addison. His topic is justice versus social justice, and it's a timely subject to address. And I'm very much looking forward to his remarks. Dr. Otteson is a professor of economics, the Thomas W. Smith and Presidential Chair in Business Ethics, and Executive Director of the Eudaimonia Institute at Wake Forest University. He specializes in political economy, the history of economic thought, 18th century moral philosophy, and business ethics. He previously taught at NYU, Yeshiva University, Georgetown University, and the University of Alabama. His books include Adam Smith's Marketplace of Life in 2002, Actual Ethics, 2006, Adam Smith, 2013, The End of Socialism, 2014, The Essential Adam Smith, this year, and also Honorable Business, A New Framework for Business in a Just and Humane Society, also published this year. Now, you might get the idea from that list that Dr. Otteson knows a thing or two about Adam Smith, but not quite in the way you might think. Many know Adam Smith as the author of The Wealth of Nations and a pioneer that gave rise to uh, much of modern economics. But before The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith wrote a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And this remarkable book deserves a lot more attention than it has received. I might summarize Smith's theory of moral sentiments as Aristotelian or Thomist ethics updated with or informed by the Enlightenment. Dr. Otteson, along with Russ Roberts, Deirdre McCluskey, and a few others, is a, is a leading reason why the theory of moral sentiments is receiving much more attention uh, than, than it used to. Dr. Otteson received a bachelor's from the University of Notre Dame, a master's in philosophy from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Chicago. He's a recipient of multiple awards for his teaching and research, including the 2007 Templeton Enterprise Award, the Aspen Institute's 2017 Ideas Worth Teaching Award, the Association of Private Enterprise Education 2019 Distinguished Scholar Award, and the Independent Institute's 2019 Independent Excellence Prize. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James Addison. Thank you very much, David, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate very much that introduction, all of that, and uh, still a disappointment to my mother-in-law, um, <laughs> but one day. Um, so my topic today is justice and social justice. Um, some of the other topics that have been addressed uh, in this series, which has been quite a terrific series, um, have been various aspects of capitalism and socialism. Um, my talk today will not directly address capitalism and socialism, but it will have some implications for that as well. Um, social justice is a term that Friedrich Hayek thought he had put a stake through the heart of uh, quite some time ago um, when he called it um, moral nonsense. Um, he said it's like speaking of a moral stone. Um, it was some kind of conceptual or category error, Hayek thought. Um, justice couldn't apply to something like society. It applied to individual interactions. Um, but as much as Hayek must have thought that, or might have thought that he had ended that discussion, discussion of social justice has in fact not stopped. In fact, if anything, in the recent years it has increased. So it might be worth revisiting. So I'd like to talk about justice and social justice 
people mean different things by those terms, and they define them in different ways. I'd like to use as my exemplar for the justice part, um, Adam Smith. So, um, oops, there we go. There. So Adam Smith, as David mentioned, actually wrote two books, not one. He wrote a book called Theory of Moral Sentiments, which came out in 1759. And his second book, the now much more famous book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Cause of the Wealth of Nations in 1776. So he only wrote those two books. Um, they went through several editions in his lifetime, but he didn't publish any other books. That's hardly enough even to get tenure in a modern university. Um, but later scholars um, looked at these two books and thought they had discovered something of a problem. So what might the problem be? So he only wrote these two books. As I said, they went through many editions in his lifetime. He was revising them side by side throughout many years of his adult life. Um, the theory of moral sentiments discussed something he called the natural human sympathy. That's his term, sympathy. He thought human beings sought out sympathy of sentiments with one another. And in The Wealth of Nations, which describes what we would now think of as economics, of course, there was no discipline called economics in the uh, 18th century. Um, it talks about where wealth comes from, what actually constitutes wealth, what kinds of policies influence the production of wealth. Um, but there he talked about self-interest. So do you see what the potential problem might be? Um, in the first book, he talked about sympathy. In the second book, he talked about self-interest. And so when scholars in the 19th century, in particular German scholars, were sort of rediscovering these two books and comparing them side by side, the question they raised was, well, which is it? Are human beings, do they have sympathy for one another, or are they self-interested? So the thought was that perhaps the, this, these two books offered competing conceptions of human morality, or maybe competing conceptions of human motivation, um, competing conceptions of human nature. Which, could it, which is it? And there are all sorts of theories that were floated about this. Um, so you know, the theory of moral sentiments was written when Smith was a relatively young man. And so they thought, well, maybe Smith was young and idealistic, and he thought people actually cared about each other. Um, then he grew up a little bit, um, and he did some traveling, including going to France. And you know, everything goes south when you go to France. And so then he realized, oh, no, people really don't care about one another. They only care about themselves. And that gave rise to the second book. So there were some scholars who thought that the second book um, constituted a rejection of the, pic of the uh, picture of human morality and human motivation in the first book. And some of these German scholars in the 19th century actually gave this alleged problem a name, a very grave-sounding name, kind of a Germanic grave-sounding name called Das Adam Smith Problem. <laughs> now, as that problem came into the 20th century, English-speaking scholars started thinking about how do these two books go together. English-speaking scholars being, of course, much wittier than the German-speaking scholars, they called it the Adam Smith Problem. Um, <laughs> that's about as close as you get to a joke in the history of economics. Um, but I would like to suggest that this is actually not just a question, an exegetical issue. It's not just a question of how to interpret Smith's books, but I think in some sense it's a question for us. Um, and the question is, is it possible to be a fully moral human being and at the same time participate in a market economy? In other words, can those be fully integrated or do we have to hedge in some way or give up some of our aspects of our morality in order to participate in a market economy? That is very much a live question for us today. It is certainly a live question for um, students. I teach at a university, and students want to know, can we support a market economy while still being fully virtuous and fully moral? So let me tell you what Adam Smith's definition of justice is, and then what I'll do is raise a potential objection that we might call a social justice objection. So here's what Smith thought justice was. Um, in the theory of moral sentiments, he said virtue with respect to other people. So not thinking about oneself, but when you're dealing with other people, Virtue has two main categories. He called one negative and one positive. Those are his terms. One was negative and one was positive. And the two were these terms. So they were general categories. The negative aspect of, just, of virtue towards other people he called justice. The positive aspect of virtue towards others he called uh, beneficence. Now, one note, and this is a terminological note, but it's actually quite important for the argument. Note that the term he's using is beneficence, not benevolence. Those are two different things. So we might not recognize the distinction between those two words today, beneficence on the one hand and benevolence on the other. I don't know if anybody even uses the term beneficence anymore. Um, but they meant very different things for Smith. Benevolence, they both come from Latin. And the, the first part of both terms, bene, comes from the Latin word meaning good. But benevolence comes from the Latin verb volere, which means to wish or will. So benevolence is wishing another well. 
If I have benevolence towards you, that means I hope things turn out well for you. So one can have benevolence towards everybody, but that's a relatively costless virtue. In other words, it doesn't actually mean I have to do anything, I just wish you well. By contrast, beneficence, the term Smith uses, that comes from the Latin verb facere, one has to say that very carefully, facere, um, which means to make or do. So beneficence means to take positive action to actually improve another person's situation. So not merely wishing another well. You can't be beneficent while sitting still and doing nothing. To be beneficent you have, means you have to actually do something which typically involves some kind of cost on you. You have to um, take positive action. So these were the two categories. Let me say a little bit more about each of them. Uh, justice is the negative virtue, and he says it, it only hinders us from hurting our neighbor. What he means by that is um, the virtue of justice is about not causing injury to other people. So it's not hurting them in their persons, their property. Um, we'll get to a couple of other aspects of it. But you act with justice, as he says, often by sitting still and doing nothing. So I assume everybody in this room right now is acting with justice with respect to everybody else. All that means is that you're not taking positive action to make another person's situation worse off. So he calls it negative in the sense that it's merely refraining from injuring another people. So in that sense, it's negative. You don't have to actually do anything positive in order to act with justice. You just have to prevent yourself from hurting somebody else. Okay, so that's justice for him. Now, what's the positive aspect of virtue towards others? That's the beneficence. That's, as I said, taking positive action to actually improve another person's situation. So you might be able to act with justice without doing anything at all, but beneficence, the other aspect of virtue, requires a person to actually engage in all the positive activities that, you might, uh, that might be required um, for, like generosity, charity, as he calls uh, friendship, and as he calls humanity towards others. All of those things are the positive actions that, re that are required for a fully virtuous life. Okay, so if that distinction between those two is clear, or at least relatively clear, look at that uh, last bullet point there. That's a claim Smith makes about beneficence that's actually quite important and will relate to what I want to say about uh, social justice. Smith says, the mere want of beneficence tends to do no real positive evil. So. Um, just think about that phrase for a second. The word want there, he means in the 18th century, um, for the 18th century definition of lack or absence. So the absence of beneficence does no real positive evil. In other words, suppose you say you would like a ride to the airport, um, and you ask me for a ride to the airport, I have a car, I'm not doing anything, I'm just sitting in my room playing Fortnite or whatever I'm doing, um, but I say no, I won't give you a ride to the airport. On Adam Smith's view, does that mean I have acted unjustly towards you? No, it doesn't, because I left you in exactly the position you were already in, which is needing a ride to the airport. I didn't make you any worse off. I just didn't take positive action to, to benefit you. So the absence of doing something for you doesn't make you worse off it, because it does no real positive evil. What would a real positive evil be? Well, if you needed a ride to the airport and I went out to your car and I punctured your, uh, your tires, Okay, that does real positive evil. That actually makes you worse off. That, therefore, would be an injustice. Okay, so that makes sense to everybody. Um, justice is the negative virtue. Beneficence is the positive virtue. Maybe you're already beginning to see how one might raise a certain kind of social justice objection. But just to summarize, injustice leaves you worse off. That constitutes what we might call an injury. Lack of beneficence leaves you exactly as you were. It doesn't do anything positive for you, but it doesn't do anything negative to you either. It leaves you in exactly the position you were. Okay, so what exactly are the rules of justice? Thankfully, Smith only gives us three of them. You can act fully in accordance with justice if you just follow these three simple rules, and I'm gonna give you a mnemonic device so that you can remember them forever for the rest of your lives. There are only three of them. Uh, first, he says, I'll just quote him, um, are the laws that guard the life and person of our neighbor, meaning you may not kill, assault, enslave another person, their bodily person. You have to um, respect their bodily person. The second one are the rules that guard the property and possessions, so you may not steal um, or trespass or destroy another person's property. And third and finally, this is the last one, um, they guard what are called his personal rights or what is due to him from the promises of others. So if you engage, if you um, voluntarily enter into a contractual relationship, you make a promise to someone, you partner with someone, you should be kept to that promise partly because other people will have changed their own lives and uh, reordered various things in their lives on the basis of your promise, so you should be, able, uh, you should be held to that promise. 
By the way, do you remember that quote from a second ago? Here's our first in-class quiz. Do you remember uh, Smith saying, um, a person may often fulfill all the duties of justice by sitting still and doing nothing? Note the often. Um, if you make a promise to somebody, Smith thinks that means you should be um, held to account for actually fulfilling that promise. Um, how could you, how would it be possible for you to still sit, do, uh, sit still and do nothing and respect that? Don't make a promise. So if you don't want to actually have to do positive activities that would be required from you from a contractual agreement or from a promise, just don't make a promise. Then you can't actually fulfill all the rules of justice by sitting still and doing nothing. Okay, so here's your mnemonic device. You ready? The three Ps. So Smith for Smith, um, justice is respecting the three Ps, person, property, and promises of others. Okay. Now I'll ask you this question, and I expect that uh, this will not be a hard uh, one to answer. If that's um, the conception of justice, what do you think Smith will argue is the main, indeed the first and primary duty of government to protect justice? So it's to protect our persons, our property, and our voluntary promises and contracts. Whatever else government might, we might consider government should do, it first has to do that, and it can't do other things that would violate any of those. That's going to be the argument. Okay, okay. so that's Smith's view of justice. Well, um, let's raise a question about it. Um, it seems, as people might say today, a rather thin conception of justice. It doesn't actually require us to engage in any positive activity. All it says is, don't injure others. And people say that seems kind of thin. The conception of justice that many people endorse today doesn't just require us to refrain from injuring, but actually to engage in positive activity to help others. So Smith's conception of justice is rather thin, and the question is, is it too thin? Should we, in fact, think about whether justice requires more of us? Maybe there are enforceable duties to help others. And that gets us close to something that we might call social justice. So as I mentioned at the outset, social justice is defined in different ways by different people. But one seeming commonality among many conceptions of social justice is that they want to incorporate positive duties to help others into the conception of justice itself. So um, they'll reject this negative, sort of defensive only conception of justice that Smith has and say there are also some duties towards other people that we have as a matter of justice, not just as a matter of charity. And I want to give one example, um, contemporary example uh, of this from Peter Singer. Some of you may know who Peter Singer is. He's a philosopher at Princeton University. Um, a few decades ago, he gave a very famous example about this. So um, a, there's a child. So this is the idea. You're on your way to an interview. You finally got your dream interview at the job that you were hoping to get. Um, you're on your way into the interview, and uh, you pass by one of those man-made fountains or something, and you notice that there's a young child drowning in the man-made fountain. You look around very quickly, you realize there's nobody, there's nobody else who will help that child, and if you don't wade into that child, the child will drown and die. On the other hand, if you do, you'll ruin your clothes, miss your interview, miss out on the dream job. And so Singer says, now remember, so it's not your child. You didn't throw the child into the, uh, into the fountain. You're not the paid on-duty lifeguard or security guard or anything like that. You had nothing to do with it except happening upon the situation. And Singer asks, um, well, what should you do? Should you save the child? Um, can we answer that all together? Should you save the child? Yeah, yeah OK, thank you. Thank you, yes. Thank you. Uh, that's not supposed to be the hard part. Uh, that's supposed to be the easy part. We should save the child. But the hard part is that, Smith, uh, that Singer thinks that's analogous to other duties that we have to help people as well. So if you imagine somebody who might be um, starving, a child who might be starving in some country halfway around the world, and you could um, at least potentially prevent that child from starving today by instead of spending $10 at Starbucks this morning, you instead send it to Oxfam. Um, Singer wants to say that's exactly the same kind of situation. There's someone that you weren't, it's not your child, you're not legally responsible. Yet nevertheless, for a very small sacrifice on your part, you might be able to create a very large benefit on another person's part. So think about the person who doesn't. And that's really where Singer's argument um, comes into play. Suppose you had somebody who, in that child drowning in the fountain scenario, decided not to save the child and just walked on by and went in for the interview. What will we say about that child? On Smith's view, could you say that uh, about the person uh, who didn't save the child? On Smith's view, we could not say that person acted unjustly. 
person didn't actually injure, didn't steal anything, didn't violate a contract or a promise, didn't act unjustly, so instead it's just insufficiently beneficent, which Singer thinks, and many other people do, uh, also do, that that seems weak, just not enough to say it's insufficiently beneficent. Um, it should be something much more robust, like unjust. And Singer appends this with this idea that letting someone die when you could have prevented it is morally equivalent to actively killing them. Singer's a utilitarian, so utilitarian looks at consequences. The consequence is the same in uh, either way, whether you actually, whether you just let somebody die, you come across somebody in the desert and, they're, um, and they need water, you have water and don't give it to them, you just let them die or if you actively went and shot them something. Either way, the person ends up dead. You could have prevented it. It's the same for Peterson. Okay, so let's think about this uh, in connection to Smith. So my suggestion is that social justice theory claims, or at least one version of social justice theory claims, that justice requires positive action in at least some cases also, and requires it as a matter of justice, not charity. And one of the reasons for thinking about it as a matter of justice and not charity is because, do you remember what's uh, for Adam Smith, the main duty of government was protect justice. And if part of justice is duties to help other people, then that becomes part of the, um, the duties of the government as well. So third parties can enforce that, um, possibly at the governmental level. Okay. So that's the objection, or the potential objection. Smith's view is too thin, doesn't allow us to think about um, possibly enforceable duties to help other people. How might Smith respond? And I'll just mention two quick responses, and then um, we can think about some uh, potential questions from the audience. So this one, I apologize about all the text here. This is a famous passage from the Wealth of Nations. First, Smithian response to what I think would be this kind of objection is this one. Uh, what's the species of domestic industry which is capital can employ and of which the produce is likely to be of the greatest value? Every individual, it is evident, can in his local situation judge much better than any statesman or lawgiver can do for him. That passage actually comes right after the invisible hand passage, in, which is the most famous one in the Wealth of Nations. Um, and I call this, I think about this as the local knowledge argument. So Smith is saying, um, he's thinking about allocating resources and allocating capital. Who's the best person, um, or who's the person best positioned to allocate resources and capital? Typically, it's the person who has localized knowledge of the particular situation, where it would be best used. Who is that? It's typically the individual, him or herself. Um, that's the argument he's making here, but I think it might apply also to this question about um, potential social justice. An implication of Smith's argument is that local individuals are able to be beneficent, but third parties, especially distant third parties, typically can't. So um, if you think about, um, you know, is David being sufficiently generous to me today um, to be here? Suppose I asked you that question. Well, how would you answer that question? I mean, maybe you know David, and so you expect that he is. But um, you the, probably expect that I wouldn't be. Right? Fair enough. <laughs> but what you might say is, we don't know. We can't really know. In order to answer that question, you'd have to know a lot of the details about what our conversations were, maybe the, the history between us, et cetera. Without knowing that, you just can't know. And think about it in another way. You see someone begging on the street, maybe you're thinking about giving that person $20. Is giving that person $20 the right thing to do? Maybe. Is giving the person nothing the right thing to do? Maybe. It, would giving $20 actually be counterproductive? That might be possible too. So how would you know? You cannot know unless you have detailed information about that person, the history, the knowledge, and that localized knowledge can only be had on a first-hand basis. So what's Smith arg Smith's argument? Individuals tend to possess this local information, this local knowledge about their own situations. Third parties don't. And one implication of that is that it's actually very difficult to help another person. Beneficence is surprisingly difficult. It's easy to make yourself feel better about something. It's very hard to know what would actually benefit another person. It takes a lot of work, and it can go wrong, and often does go wrong in many ways. So it's very difficult to know. In any case, for a distant third party, someone in well, Washington, D.C., perhaps, um, it's very hard for them to have any idea what would benefit anybody that they don't actually know. All right, that's the first uh, potential response. So local knowledge is required to be to have effective beneficence. Second um, response, I'm going to call this a failure to launch. Um, 
So there's a position in political philosophy called luck egalitarianism. I apologize about that long term. It's hard to say. Luck egalitarianism. What does that mean? It, it's, a, it's a fairly simple idea. The idea is that luck plays a role in our lives. So some people have good luck. Some people have bad luck. Um, some people were lucky enough to be born into a family that loved them. They were sent to good schools. Maybe they lived in a place that was not war-torn and violent. Um, all of that is good luck. They can't claim to have done it themselves. They're just born into those situations. On the other hand, there are people who didn't have such good luck. Maybe they weren't born into good families, or they didn't, weren't sent to good schools, or they um, live in a violent or war-torn place. What the luck egalitarian says is that in both cases, the fruits of their lives are undeserved to the extent that it's a, an effect of luck. If at least some of your success in life is due to factors totally outside of your control that you had nothing to do with, in other words, good luck, then, and or on the other side, if some of the relative lack of success you've had in life is due to negative factors that you had nothing to do with, just luck, what the luck egalitarian says is, why don't we redistribute some of the fruits of the success of the people who've been especially lucky to the people who have been especially unlucky to help equalize the effect of luck in the world? That's hence the name luck egalitarianism. We want to equalize the effect of luck in life. Okay? Now, how does that constitute a potential objection to the Smithian view? Well, in the Smithian view, this would not be a role for government. If government's main job is to protect person, property, and promise, equalizing for luck is not going to be something it should do. And the luck egalitarian says, but isn't it true that some people succeed, say, in a market economy or in a commercial society purely by luck? Well, maybe not purely by luck, but does luck have a role, play a role? Yes, it does. Um, and so the implicit argument is that maybe this is a role for justice. Let's think about justice correcting some of that. That's a potential objection. Let me tell you how I think, a, give you a Smithian. I'm going to try to offend as many people as possible with this. A Smithian, he doesn't quite say this, but a Smithian response. If you had some undeserved bad luck in your life, in other words, luck, it was luck, it was bad luck, and we all agree that you didn't deserve it. Um, and if you also, in addition to that, were disappointed by how things turned out, and we agree it was reasonable that you're disappointed, you would feel disappointed as well. Even if you have both of those, it doesn't necessarily mean, not yet anyway, that anybody owes you anything. Have I offended some people? I see some of this and some of that. <clears throat> so just to be clear, so there are some theorists who say if you had either one of those, either bad luck, undeserved bad luck, or reasonable disappointment, then you would be entitled to some kind of compensation or should be entitled to some compensation. I want to take the hard case. Even if you have both of those, it doesn't yet mean that anybody owes you anything. Okay, That's my argument. And I'm going to give you an, uh, an example to make it seem as if uh, that might be plausible if it wasn't already plausible to you. Um, I want you to consider two people, Jack and Jill. These are Their names have been protect, changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> Jack and Jill were uh, seniors at Wake Forest University, majoring in economics. They'd been dating for some time. Jack was starting to think that Jill was maybe the one for him, and Jill was starting to think that maybe Jack was the one for her. Um, it was March of their senior year, and they're beginning to make plans for what they're going to do with the rest of their lives, and they're starting to think, well, should we coordinate and think about going to the same cities? On a Sunday evening, Jack calls Jill and says, uh, Jill, I'd like to take you to dinner next uh, Saturday night. And she says, great. And he says, uh, it's going to be special. And she says, it's going to be special. And he says, it's going to be special. <laughs> so she says, great, I'll see you then. She hangs up the phone, and she says to her roommates, hey, Jack just invited me to dinner next Saturday night. And he says, it's going to be special. You don't think he's going to ask me to marry him, do you? And they say, he is totally going to ask you to marry him. <laughs> so she begins to think. What if he does? What will I say? And so she imagines what you know, all the things that you might imagine. She's thinking about it. She tries writing her name, Mrs. Jack, on things to see how it fits. <laughs> she decides that if he asks me to marry him, I'm going to say yes. Okay, that's her decision. Now, that was Sunday night. Um, as soon as Jack got off the phone with her, he called the restaurant, and he said, I want to make a reservation for two for my girlfriend and me. I'm going to ask her to marry me. And they said, oh, that's wonderful. We'll have violins and flowers. It'll be great. On Monday morning, the very next day, Monday morning, Jill is in an econometrics class. She's not really paying much attention because she's thinking about what might be going on um, on Saturday. And uh, as the class ends, she walks out, and she gets stopped by Joe. Now, who is Joe? Well, again, the name has been changed to protect the innocent. Joe is a person who'd been in class all semester. She didn't really know him. 
On this day, for some reason that nobody really knows why, he stopped her on the way out and said, hey, Jill, I missed what the professor said at that one point in class. Did you get it in your notes? And she said, let me look at my notes. And she said, um, she looks at her notes, and she looks at Joe, and there's a bit of a smudge. So they chat for a few minutes, and he says, hey, would you like to go get a cup of coffee? And she says, sure, I have another class now, but I don't need to go. And so they go and have a cup of coffee, and they spend a few hours with each other. In fact, they miss all the rest of their classes all the rest of the day. Um, Joe, it's now dinner time, and Joe says, oh my gosh, I can't believe how much time has flown. Um, would you like to go get a bite to eat? And she says, oh, well, I was supposed to visit my grandmother in intensive care, but I'm sure she's fine. Yes, uh, let's go get a bite to eat. Um, and they spend more time with each other. They walk, after eating, they walk the quad, they go to the library, they walk the quad some more, they spend the rest of the night together. It is now Tuesday morning, sun is coming up over campus, Joe looks at the sun, he looks at Jill, and he says, I've never felt what I'm feeling right now before, and I've never met anybody like you, Jill, but marry me, right now. Let's go to a justice of the peace right now and get married. Now, Jill sort of snaps out of whatever reverie she's been in and realizes she's just spent nearly 24 hours with this virtual stranger. She looks at her phone for the first time, and she has 700 texts and Snapchats from, from all of her friends wondering, are you dead? What happened to you? Should we call the state police? Um, and what, some, some of those texts were from Jack. You remember him? <laughs> um, so she's thinking about all of these things, and she looks at Joe, and she says, yes. <laughs> and they go and get married that very day. Now, coincidentally, the previous day when Jill was in her econometrics class, Jack was in a jewelry store buying a, an engagement ring. Um, he used his student loan money. And, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Do not use your student loan money for that, but he bought her a ring. Um, but Joe and Jill went and got married that very day. OK, there's my scenario. Now, here's what I want to ask you. Think for a second about Jack. Was Jack, uh, did Jack have some bad luck? It seems he had some bad luck. The, the week you were going to ask your long-term girlfriend to marry you, she happens to run into some total stranger that, and they decide to elope immediately. Seems like bad luck. If he's disappointed, as he no doubt is, is it reasonable? Would you be disappointed in a similar situation? Sure, I think we would all agree that that seems like that's reasonable disappointment. Now, my question is, what can we do about it? Should Jack be able to sue Jill for the future affection he expected to get from her and now will not? Should he be able to sue for damages for the nine children he imagined she would bear him one day and now won't? Or for all of the time that he had invested in this relationship that has now come to a sudden unexpected end? No. Of course, the answer to all of those things is no. But the reason is extremely important. The reason is because Jack had no right to Jill. Jill is a free person. She gets to decide to whom to give or from whom not to give her affection, her time, her love, et cetera, even if that decision comes about at least in part by luck and even if it disappoints other people. Jack had no right to Jill. So is, Jill, is, Joe, is Jack owed anything? Well, if you're a friend of Jack's, uh, maybe out of friendship to him, you say, yeah, you, know, you take him out for a beer and you say, dude, that was a bummer. Um, that's fine. Maybe you introduce him to, we'll say with the J's, Jenny, or um, maybe Julie, okay, or Jerry. Um, any of those things is fine. Um, but can you visit a cost? Was it an injury that was done to Jack um, so that you can visit a cost for compensation on Jill? And my answer to that is no. Now, what does that have to do with markets? I I think the same thing happens in a commercial society. If you own a coffee shop, and every day I go to your coffee shop, and lots of people go to your coffee shop, and one day a coffee shop opens right up right across the street, I like that one better, and I start going to it instead of yours. Maybe lots of your customers go to the new one. Um, is it bad luck that a coffee shop opened up across the street from you? Yes. Is it disappointing to you if people stop coming to your co coffee shop? Yes. Is it reasonable disappointment? Yes. Is there anything you should be able to do about it? No. And for exactly the same reason. The owner of a coffee shop has no more right to patrons or to patrons' resources than Jack had a right to Jill. Okay. All right. One last matter, and then we'll end. Um, inequality is the last uh, major thing, or one major thing that social justice deals with. Um, should inequality be a matter of justice? 
So is there material inequality in a commercial society, or would there be material inequality in a society that, um, whose government had only the institutions that Smith described, protecting person, property, and promise? Yes, there certainly would be. Is that a matter of concern for justice? So my question is, should justice address material inequality? Let me give you just a quick thought experiment about that. Suppose you have two people, A and B, but A is much wealthier than B. Let's say A has 100 times as much wealth as B. Now, without knowing anything else about them, without knowing their situations or who they are, are you inclined to think that a society must be unjust in which one person can have 100 times as much wealth as another person? That there's no way for that to have happened without some injustice having taken place. So maybe you think it's a failure of justice, or maybe if you like to use the term, a failure of social justice. So you think about it, while you're thinking about it, let me tell you who my A and B are. Um, here's my A, do you recognize him? That's Bill Gates, uh, there he is saying, thank God I live in a capitalist country. Um, what is Bill Gates worth? Well, um, his worth goes up and down with the market, but he, like many other people, has been enjoying the rising market in the last couple of years, so it's a little over $100 billion is his net worth. It's estimated, um, I checked it today, it's $100.1 billion, according to Forbes this morning. I could live on that. Um, so it's about $100 billion. What's a billion among friends? It's approximately a billion dollars. Now, who is the poor soul who has to struggle through life worth only one one-hundredth of Bill Gates's wealth? Um, now, there are many people you might pick. I decided to pick a neighbor of mine. I live in North Carolina. Here's my neighbor. You recognize that? That's Michael Jordan. He's not actually my neighbor. Uh, he does live in North Carolina, but I don't live next to him. There's Michael Jordan. Uh, what is Michael Jordan's net worth? Um, what's uh, one one-hundredth of 100 billion? It's a billion. So he's worth about a billion dollars. Now, what is that supposed to show? This is an extreme example, obviously. What is that supposed to show? Here's what I think it's supposed to show. If you want to know whether there's some injustice that pertains to a situation in which one person is much wealthier than another, first of all, you have to know, you have to answer that first question. How did the wealthier person get it? Did he get it through force, fraud, theft, colonialism, imperialism, extraction? That matters. Because if those are the ways that he got it, then on the Smithian view, that's injustice. And that does require compensation. On the other hand, is all of it through mutually voluntary and mutually beneficial cooperative transactions? That's a very different story. So you first need to know how do they get it. The mere fact of a difference doesn't tell you that. And then the second, of course, is you have to know about the absolute quality of the poorer person's life. Michael Jordan is extremely poor relative to Bill Gates, not relative to most of humanity. So the idea that we should redistribute some of Bill Gates' wealth to Michael Jordan to somehow compensate for that differential just seems absurd. But maybe you're not willing to go quite along with that because that's a, an extreme case. Are there people in the United States who have a 1,000 times more wealth than others? 10,000 times? 100,000 times? Those are raising this by orders of magnitude. Let's do even double that. Let's go 200,000 times. So imagine somebody who has only one 200,000th of Bill Gates's wealth. Now, who is the person who has to, the poor schmuck, who has to soldier through life being worth only one two hundred thousandth of Bill Gates's wealth? That's me. Actually, I'm rounding up quite a bit just to make the, num the numbers. So what is that supposed to show? I think it, again, shows that both A and B. But the real question I think and I would leave, with, leave you with is to think about is this. Suppose you had it in your power to change one thing about the world, but only one thing. Would you end poverty in the world? Or would you end inequality in the world? Um, I think your answer to that might give you some indication of the system of political economy that you might end up endorsing. Um, but I think this is a real question, because historical experiments seem to suggest that that's the real dilemma we actually face. We have been able to figure out, finally, how to allow people to rise out of poverty. But the only way system of principles and policies that have enabled that to happen have also allowed for inequality. So substantially, everyone does get better, but not at the same rate. On the other hand, we also know how to keep everybody relatively equal, but when we keep them relatively equal, they are equally poor. So that seems to be the trade-off that we actually face. Okay. The most famous this passage from Adam Smith was the Invisible Hand passage. The second most famous passage is this one, the butcher, brewer, baker. It's not the, from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker, that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interests. 
When you read that passage or think about that, do you hear Adam Smith advocating selfishness? Be selfish? That's what Karl Marx thought. Karl Marx read The Wealth of Nations, or at least this, there was 20 pages into it. He read at least this far. Um, but I want to suggest that that's not what Smith thought was going on. And that's an important point to make because it's a different way of thinking about equality. What Smith thought was going on was respect, mutual respect between you and the butcher, the brewer, or the baker. Because the only way you can successfully execute a mutually voluntary transaction is if I offer you something that matters to you. That's the only way you can do it. And the only way I'm going to be able to offer you something that matters to you is I have to respect you and your interests and your goals and purposes in life. And I have to think about you. And the way we respect that in, pr in practice is by allowing everybody what I call an opt-out option. Everybody can say no thank you. If all people of whatever social class, race, religion, ethnicity, or anything else, if all people have the ability and the right to say no thank you, to any offer that's made, then immediately our moral statuses are leveled. We meet each other as moral peers. Jeff Bezos can come in and say, I'll give you a billion dollars to work for me. But as long as you have the right to say no thank you and go elsewhere, all of that wealth he has doesn't matter anymore at all. You vote for both of you, your agencies are perfectly leveled. That means that there's a kind of respect that's required in a market economy that you don't have when one person can mandate um, or impose terms or options on others. So what we get there is an equality of moral agency, moral authority, not necessarily material resources, but moral authority. All right. So here's my conclusion. Smith argues that political mechanisms can and should respect his conception, that negative conception of justice, but they cannot and they shouldn't even try to engage in positive beneficence. But remember, at the very outset, I said that a fully virtuous life requires both justice and beneficence. So if that's the case, on whom does the primary responsibility for beneficence fall? If the government can't or shouldn't do it, which is Smith's view, then on whom is the responsibility for beneficence, actually improving the lives of people who need it? Who does that fall on? That falls on you and me as individuals. That becomes our moral responsibility either singly or in voluntary cooperation with other people, it is now our responsibility. And Smith actually thought that this was a much more demanding and difficult moral picture than if you just wrote a check and send it off somewhere and let somebody else take care of it. In Smith's view, you can't execute, you can't successfully engage your moral responsibilities to others by having somebody else do it for you or by being forced to do it. You have to have the right to say no, and then you have to positively engage in the act of will to say yes. So what you get from Smith is what I would call global justice and local beneficence. You should act, you should respect the rules of justice with respect to everybody you meet anywhere on the planet. Never injure or harm a person in their person, property, or promise. On the other hand, where should you engage in beneficence where you have the local knowledge to know that what you're contemplating would actually benefit or stands a good chance of benefiting the person you're thinking about benefiting? Global, global justice and local beneficence. And in that way, I think what you can get from Smithian political economy is not only prosperity, and by the way, we haven't even talked about the prosperity that that can lead to. That's just icing on the cake. But you also get morality, because it suggests the proper way of dealing with others is to meet them as moral peers, respect their opt-out options, and look for ways to engage cooperatively in mutually voluntary and mutually beneficial transactions. And that way, you might get what I would call, perhaps, true social justice. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. We have time for some audience questions. But just looking at that last slide, I, was, I wanted to ask you something. Do do you, yeah, well, it's the local beneficence. Do, yeah. do you uh, see a relationship between that idea in the natural law or, or Roman Catholic idea of subsidiarity? I do see that. Now, I, I happen to be a Roman Catholic, um, but um, I didn't want to. I'm not. But. I don't think you have to subscribe to Catholicism to see this view, but I think there's a very clear similarity there. And I think even the reasoning is very similar. Um, you can't help somebody. You can, there's no such thing as um, a telescopic philanthropy, meaning um, you know, a person can love the whole world, but without actually helping a single human being. 
What this requires is, or what it uh, entails, is a paying attention to actual human beings and their actual situations. Um, and that can only happen at the lowest level possible. So it does imply a kind of subsidy. So at the highest level, what should the government do? Protect justice. And as you get down to lower levels, that enables people to actually engage in the um, kinds of charitable, philanthropic, but also other uh, positively beneficent activities they could engage in. So I do, th I do think there's a connection there. All right, questions from the audience. The young lady in the pink. Yes, ma'am. So I'm just curious about the explanation behind your first two thought experiments. Why in the second one if is I it? Could, I mean, this is my fault. I, if you could say your name and identify any institutional affiliation as we go on. Oh, yeah. My name is Kellyanne Elliott. I'm working with the National Legal Aid and Defenders Association, focusing on um, court fines and fees and mass incarceration. Um, so I'm curious about the two thought experiments. Why is it fundamentally just to help the drowning child who doesn't necessarily have a right to your time and resources when it's not fundamentally just to help someone who's just had bad luck? Uh, good question. So um, are you asking on Smith's view or, or in general? Let me tell you Smith's view and we can see what you think about that. So Smith's view is that if you don't, hold the if you don't help the child, um, so what should we say about a person who doesn't help the child in that situation? Um, what Smith's view requires or um, means that he must not be able to say is that that person was unjust. So it wasn't an act of injustice. Um, it was an act of failure of beneficence, so a genuine failure of beneficence. Smith thinks we actually have duties of beneficence, so it's not like if the government doesn't make you do it that therefore anything goes. For him, it mean, being a moral person means you have a whole range of duties. Some of them are negative and then some of them are positive. Um, so, it wouldn't, so we wouldn't be able to call that person unjust, but what we could do is call that person a, you know, so suppose you're that person. You walk by the, the fountain, you don't help the child, what can we do about it? On Smith's view, we can't put you in jail, we can't um, fine you or, or exile you or something. What we could do, though, is put your picture in the newspaper on, with the caption under it, Moral Monster. Um, that, we're, that we can do, or nowadays I guess we could tweet. We have a tweet storm about you. Um, and. So those things are allowable because that's not preventing anybody from, that's not prevent, uh, causing an injury to you, and it's also not preventing anybody forcibly from engaging with you, partnering with you, hiring you, marrying you, et cetera. Um, but what it does do is bring an enormous amount of, and that is a very powerful thing to do. I mean, uh, tweets bring down CEOs in, in the world now. So exposing someone to people's, publicly to people's negative moral judgment is maybe a surprisingly powerful way to deal with it. But on Smith's view, it's not, an in, it's not an act of justice. So you still would have been just, but that doesn't mean you were moral because you failed in your duty of beneficence. This gentleman here. You know. Which one? Which one? Well, well, yeah. Okay, and then we'll go right behind. Uh, Seth Weisberg, citizen from Denver, Colorado. Um, I think some of your analogies were not apt. Jack and Jill seem to be very suitably independent actors. The drowning child has very few uh, capabilities. Um, the coffee shop, your opponents, I'm not really one of them, said that one of those was Bill Gates's coffee shop where they're giving away free in order to run me out of business. Mm -hmm. So they would say skip Jack and Jill and see this as, as social force. You said and the wealth of the two people, as long as was not extracting or extorting, I think Senator Sanders would see this economic system as one where the wealthy have taken the excess profits that they extorted from the proletariat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe just now that I've sharpened the other side sort of it, could you answer that? Yeah, I think those are, I'm trying to challenge precisely those premises. Um, so those examples are designed to illustrate that the conclusions that we come, that maybe a Senator Sanders or other people who might uh, subscribe to those conclusions are pretty far, far downstream of principles that we have to look at before we get there. So the principles I think we have to look at before we get to those kinds of conclusions, whatever we, however we end up assessing, say, the actual results of a market economy, whether they're good or bad or fair or unfair, before we ever get there, we have to think about how is the right way to deal with individual human beings? What's the right way? To, that human beings should deal with one another. And those, I think, are the fundamental principles. And everything else about political economy, economics, policy, all of that should flow from the right way that uh, human beings should deal with one another. 
So the examples of things like Jack and Jill are meant to illustrate that when you have a situation where people, um, even if they have bad luck, even if they have reasonable disappointment, that doesn't yet settle the question of whether one of them is owed compensation. The example is meant to bring that out intuitively, but we can be more precise about it. Um, compensation is owed when there has been some infraction of justice, and once we understand what we mean by justice, well, that makes it a pretty clear case. So the example doesn't by itself do anything other than begin to make the premises that there is something that society might owe somebody if somebody's in a bad situation, or you know, using the term society without any reference to a specific in individual, um, or that maybe a third party, the government, let's say, um, is properly positioned to be able to manage or superintend these sorts of transactions. Um, those are conclusions that are based on premises that those kinds of, the, the kinds of analogies I want to draw actually challenge. So I think we do have to begin. I mean, I teach in a business school, um, and in a business school, you know, we want to learn about marketing and economy uh, and finance and accounting, et cetera. Um, but if we want to, you know, one of the arguments I make to my business school colleagues and I always make to people in the business world is that um, if you want to dedicate your life to business or think about training people in business, you have to think about what's the moral vision that those business practices are actually part of. So if you criticize the business practices, um, that's too far downstream. You need to start up earlier. And I think the kind of objection that, we might, that one might get from a Bernie Sanders for the things that they say, that maybe they have philosophical apparatus behind it, but the things that they say is actually pretty far down the conclusion line. And I want to challenge those initial premises. The gentleman here. Gabriel Greenspan from the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Um, I, I found your presentation very um, interesting and intellectually stimulating, but I wanted to play devil's advocate on one point. So um, you brought up uh, Peter Singer's example of the drowning child, and does this person driving by, the only person who can save the child, have a moral responsibility? Would it be unjust for this person to let the child die? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And... The main objection, or the main objection from Adam Smith, the main counter argument from Adam Smith, that he would make to um, Peter Singer, th that I could hear at least from a legal perspective, is that essential is um, th th this idea of local of of things being localized. In other words, this person who's um, helping who who fails to help the drowning child, that was like a localized case where you failed to help another human being, which is different from me refusing to give a check to people suffering in other parts of the world, or even me refusing to give a check to the government to help people suffering in the United States, um, that like lack of localization, that lack of immediacy um, makes it le less effective. And that seems to be the, the crux of Adam Smith's argument for why those two cases are different. Um, but you look at you know practical life, you have people who donate large sums of money that you know, tangent to organizations and that tangibly does help people in other parts of the world, people in Africa or Asia or, or wherever. You, you even have individual cases where despite the incompetence, um, Medicare does specifically help specific elderly people. Medicaid does specifically help. Let's try to people. wrap it up and yeah. ask your question. And so, you know, you, you have like specific cases in real life where people are helped by non-localized help. So is the Smithian response, um, isn't it more complicated than that in real life? Well, I had only a 30-minute presentation. Um, so yes, the, the, the actual Smithian argument about justice is quite a bit more complicated than what I just gave today. Um, but I would say two quick things in the interest of time, two quick things about that. So Smith's view is that it's largely an empirical view. So his conception of justice is not derived from a priori principles. It's not from, at least not explicitly from, say, natural law or nat the Lockean tradition or the Thomistic tradition. Um, he surveys different human experiments, social experiments, and looks and wants to know which ones actually do well and which ones don't. And the empirical conclusion the, that he arrives at inductively is that um, the more closely one's public uh, society's public institutions um, center on protecting justice, as he described, um, the, the more flourishing that community will be. So his argument, at least explicitly, seems to be that it's an empirical argument, but he himself is open to um, particular cases where we might make exceptions. So he says this is what the default should be, but they're robust defaults. Um, if there's some case where you think the government should provide some particular good or a service to others, he's open to the argument, but it would put the burden of proof on you. And you'd have to re meet a fairly high standard. The standard would be twofold. One, it would have to be something that uh, substantially everybody benefits from. 
not something that benefits one group or person at the expense of another group or person. And two, it would be, have to be something that's unable to be provided by private action or private enterprise. Um, those two criteria, they're conjuncts for him, not disjuncts, meaning not one or the other, but they have to be both, and that's a pretty high standard. Um, it is a high standard, but it is a standard. So there, there might be exceptions, and maybe some of the things you're talking about might be exceptions. So that's just a little bit more of the, um, uh, more of the subtlety of the way Smith addresses it. One other thing I wanted to mention about that, and it's really a general case. So um, almost any activity um, that one might engage in, you might imagine, could lead to some good. Um, but if I, if I decide to, say, allocate resources in a certain way, or I'm proposing to allocate resources in a certain way, and I say, look, here's some good that might come out of it, or maybe here's some good that did come out of something that we did in the past, that doesn't yet complete the argument. Very important to see why that is, and Smith had this in the uh, Wealth of Nations, because you also have, because we live in a world of scarce resources, meaning there are, we always want more than we have resources to actually um, achieve, what we always have to do is compare the opportunity cost. We always have to ask, okay, um, but what would those resources have done if they had been put somewhere else? And so, in other words, saying that this was a good use of resources because something good came out of it doesn't follow. Um, because there are many good things that one might potentially do, but because we live in a world of scarce resources, we can't just say any old good thing is good. We have to use the best, because if we don't, or look for the best, because if we don't, then we're squandering some of our scarce resources and maybe giving up other things that might have actually had even better outcomes. And so some of the cases that you mentioned, I think, might actually be candidates for exactly that. Lady on the end of, of the line. Hi, my name is Melissa Ortiz, and I am a visiting fellow with Independent Women's Forum. And my question kind of goes to the heart of thing. Well, let me very quickly say about Peter Singer, it always cracks me up when people cite him as some sort of moralist instead of philosopher, so I was glad you called him a philosopher, because he thinks it's wrong for the child to in the, in the fountain to die, but he's absolutely okay with someone like me dying and dying in the wound, because I am a drain on society and social justice warriors agree with him, which I think is pretty sad. Now, to my thought, I love that our founding fathers put in, the const in, the, um, in our founding documents the pursuit of happiness, because equal opportunity does not guarantee equal outcome. Would you say that a way that we could best live out Adam Smith's ideas locally is to look at somebody and say, what can I do that would best help you? Somebody who seems to have bad luck or is in an untenable situation. I know I recently lost my job and a bunch of people before I became an independent fellow with um, independent, independent woman, I'll get it out in a minute, a visiting fellow with Independent Women's Forum. And a bunch of my friends came to me and said, we know you're getting ready to have surgery. We know you have all these things going on. How can we best help you? How can we best care for you as our fellow human being? And that was hugely refreshing because I was able to articulate to them what my exact needs were, what my husband's needs were, what our needs were as a family. Would you say that that fits in with a Smithian idea or does that fit more on the SJW side? No, that sounds to me like, to, like that is an example of the Smithian. Um, and one other piece of that, I think, would be that on Smith's view, what you might get, so think about just the political economy for a second rather than the morality. Mm -hmm. Um, a government, so a society in which you have a government that protects person, property, and promise, and mm -hmm. doesn't do very much else, but that, or the, at least that's the main activity of government, is one in which prosperity will rise. Exactly. Was writing in 1776, when the Wealth of Nations came out, and he was predicting that a country, in fact, he even said, maybe even America could one day be wealthier than Britain, which was a rather scandalous thing to suggest in 1776, and yet look what happened. He was a scandalous man. In many ways he was. Um, but one of, the, one of the ancillary benefits of the increasing prosperity that that, that that system of political economy might enable is more resources so that individuals can put to exactly the beneficent uses that they, with their localized no, knowledge, might know might actually help. So that for him would actually, so as wealth increases overall, that relieves the burden on his view, maybe sort of paradoxically. It makes it less important for centralized agencies to be helping people who are indigent or otherwise need help um, because you have individuals, more and more of them, with more and more resources that enables them to more fully achieve their own moral lives by helping other people as well. So it sounds like that's an example of it to me. Yeah, that's, that's right. thanks. Michael. 
Michael Maybach with the James Wilson Institute. Um, ideally, if, if, if Adam Smith was here today, would he say that federal housing subsidies from HUD and the food stamps system from the Department of Agriculture be localized to local government or ended with local charities picking those things up? Good question. So um, to one of the earlier questions, I mentioned that Smith had this sort of default of the government should only protect justice unless for some particular good or service it could meet that pretty high uh, standard. Um, one of the things to note about that standard is that it might change over time. Um, so as the wealth or other resources or demography or other things change in society, what meets those two criteria might change over time. So it's a bit of an open-ended criteria. As high as the bar is, it's still relatively open-ended. Um, how I think that relates to your question is, um, you know, it may be that uh, you mentioned HUD and what else did you mention? Agriculture. Agriculture. Um, so maybe those things might meet those bars at some points in, say, America's history, and maybe not in others. So it doesn't specifically, the test doesn't specifically tell you what will pass it. It just gives you criteria for judging. Um, but more specifically, I think what a Smithian would say is doing those kinds of things at the federal level is probably the worst of all possible options because of the local knowledge issue that the federal government, that federal agents just don't have. Um, so if they're going to exist at all, and if they actually meet those criteria, it's probably going to have to be at a much more local level. Um, it may well be that at some point in the growth of wealth or growth of prosperity in a country, that individuals and, ch and private charities can take care of all of the actually needy cases um, sufficiently or maybe even better than they could do it if, uh, through centrally. So, they, so it may end up being the case that at some point abolition of them is the right thing to do. Um, but in any case, putting it at the highest level of the, of the government would be the worst, uh, worst of all the possibilities, I think Smith would say. Patrick, in the back. Hi, Hi Patrick Terrell, the Heritage Foundation. Uh, would Smith, did he say anything that might indicate that he might think something along the lines of, in the case of the drowning child, there's only one person that can save the child, so that person's 100% responsible for the death. But uh, in sending $10 to save someone starving in another country, there might be a billion people that could send the $10, and they don't. So maybe they're only responsible one billionth of the most of the, for the death of that person. Yeah, so we should discount the uh, moral culpability by the number of potential, yeah. Um, so Smith, I don't think, addresses that uh, possibility in particular. Singer does, however. I'll tell you how Singer responds to that objection. Um, so he says, well, imagine you're in the same scenario. There's a child drowning in the fountain. You could save the person. But now you notice that there are 20 other adults standing around the fountain looking at the child. None of them are doing anything. Um, so Singer says, does that mean now you are relieved from doing it? It's OK to go ahead and let the child drown because any one of them might have been able to do it? and they didn't do it either. Um, his answer is no, you're still morally, you still should have gone in to help the child, even if there were other people who were there. So Singer himself, I think, would not accept the, um, you know, sort of the democratizing of the guilt. You know, the more people are who could help, um, that lowers your level of guilt. If it, so he still wants to insist on this claim. If you could help someone uh, or prevent someone from dying, even if other people could too, if you're one of them, then it still falls on your shoulders. And I, I mean, I think from Smith's perspective, it might be possible. I mean, we would still say you didn't act with sufficient beneficence. And maybe even it was a moral duty that you had to act beneficently, positively to help the child, even if there are many other people who could do it as well. Um, the difference would be whether if you failed to do that, could we punish you or not? Could we put you in jail or fine you? Singer would say yes, I think. Smith would say no. Over here. Hi, my name is Kira I'm from the organization National Legal Aid and Defender Association. Um, your definition of justice, I was curious, not your definition, but Smith's definition of justice also says a right or a promise is, how would you define or what constitutes a right? Is it just a promise from one human to another human or can it be an institution to society? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good and hard question to answer. So. We can think of an easy case. An easy case is if you and I have some kind of promise or a contr contract, let's take a case like a contract. Um, I come to work for you, you hire me, we have a contract that specifies. So I'm gonna have rights under that contract because we voluntarily entered into it, that's gonna create certain kinds of rights. 
There are other cases of rights that we could easily understand if we pass a law and the law recognizes certain you as a person who has certain kinds of legal standing, it might mean that you have rights under the law. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean anything about natural rights or anything like that. It's just very specific, human-made, positive rights. So if rights are made by the law, does that mean that he actually did believe in equality since, like, Title IX, that ensures equality for women? So if he's saying that people are guaranteed rights, even if it's an institution promising to society those rights, <clears throat> his definition of justice would include equality. That's a little more complicated. Okay. So he doesn't, he doesn't say that uh, people are, should be guaranteed rights. That's not the kind of language he uses. He's only, when he uses the term rights, he's specifically using it typically with respect to a law that gives you rights or a contract under which you have rights. He does talk about other kinds of personal rights. Um, a child might have a claim against its parent. If you brought me into the world, then part of the, the act of bringing me into the world is providing food for me and other sorts of things. Um, that's much more nebulous. I mean, this is the 18th century, so you get it. Um, but trying to think about Title IX, um, here's one maybe quick way to, that I think a Smithian, if Smith were you know, to come back to come uh, to life to life in the 21st century, um, one of the amazing things about the way Smith approaches political economy um, is that right at the beginning of the Wealth of Nations, he talks about people being roughly equal to one another in their capabilities and their abilities, and he suggests that the differences we see among human beings is largely due to education habit and training rather than natural differences. That's really an astonishing claim for someone to make in the 18th century. Nobody believed that. Everybody believed that the differences among people were either God-given or natural in some kind of deep way. And they believed in all sorts of you know, rankings of peoples and you know, this people superior to this people. And they even constructed these rankings. Smith comes along and says, no, everybody is roughly equal in their natural capacities. And therefore, everybody should be able to enter into voluntary contracts or say no thank you to a voluntary contract, regardless of where you come from or what country you're in, et cetera. Um, so I think that could apply very well and would have applied. I think the Smithian argument would apply to women, for example. Um, and he would have been one of the first great theorists to actually make that claim that um, all people, regardless of their origins or other differences of, uh, among them, they're capable of saying, yes to something, and they're capable of saying no thank you. Um, and the best kind of society is one that has a government that protects their answer, whatever it is. Others, OK. Well, I have, I guess, one last, um, oh, over here, sorry. Hello, Brian O'Quinn, Heritage Foundation. Um, you said that you can avoid injustice, or Smith said, by just sitting there generally. Yeah. Are there any cases where you would be compelled to act to avoid injustice? Um, where I would be, so maybe some of the cases that, uh, that are connected with the, the previous question. Um, so if um, I have some kind of relationship with you that we've entered into, maybe, um, maybe you're my brother. I might have a familial responsibility to you that's not the result of an actual written contract, um, but it's a moral responsibility. Um, if we're married, if we're parent and ch child, maybe also if we're, um, you know, if we have some sort of relationship that's more political, we're members of the same community or the same religion or something, then maybe we could imagine that we have some kind of duty. All of those things are things Smith is willing, in fact, he talks about some of these things at great length. Um, the only distinction is, and maybe this is the one that might matter to you, I'm not sure whether it would matter to you. The only distinction is whether what kinds of duties along those lines we have that a third party not related to either one of us has a right to enforce. That's a separate special category for him. Um, so it may well be that sitting still doing nothing means you are failing in your duties as a parent or a husband or a father or a person or various other ways. Um, but if we mean by that the failure now can invoke or authorize some third uh, party to punish you, um, that he wants to reserve largely for the specific conception of justice where you actually are injuring somebody, not just not helping. Okay, great. I guess the, the one thing I th thought might be worth talking a little bit about, if uh, Smith was part of this so-called Scottish Enlightenment, which, of course, had a tremendous influence over the American founders. 
And that really has very different conceptions of justice and role of government from other aspects of the Enlightenment, particularly the French, but also the German. I was wondering if you could sort of maybe talk about how different the Scottish Enlightenment that influenced our founding was from the continental European versions of it. Well, and their, conception, and their conception of justice. How is the Scottish Enlightenment different from uh, the French Enlightenment or the German Enlightenment? With respect to the issue With of justice. With respect to justice. Um, so I think that, that's a very large question, obviously. There are uh, many ways one might take that. Um, one of the things about, I'll say one thing about the Scottish Enlightenment and connected with one thing about maybe some of these other uh, um, episodes of it that we now call Enlightenment. One of the things that the Scots were very impressed with, the Scots in this period, so 1720 to 1790 approximately, it's now called the Scottish Enlightenment. They're very impressed with what Newton was able to do. Um, in the previous century. So at the end of the uh, 17th century, um, you had Newton who described you know, how things moved in the, in the world, in our world and outside the world, a few principles that described all of this. They were very impressed by that and thought, one, could we do something like that for understanding human relations? So they were empirically oriented, historically oriented, and they wanted to use induction, not first principles. And I think that's one of the big differences. So what you often got in the French Enlightenment and <clears throat> many other species of Enlightenment is very smart people who wanted to say, all right, let's think hard about what justice ought to be. Um, and let's see if we can understand, maybe even apprehend in some way, some first principles, some a priori first principles. And if we get those things, then maybe we can start deducing some more specific principles until we get all the way down to what should the government look like or right, what activities should the government do. That was not at all the kind of process that the Scots, and I'm speaking very generally, obviously, but the, the Scots were interested. They, they wanted to go the other way around. Let's look at human experiments and society and see which, which ones do well. Let's see if we can find any commonalities. And if we can, let's see if we can just define some principles. And if we can define those principles, maybe we can use those as recommendations for other people. If you want your society to flourish, maybe these are the principles you should try. So rather than having the kind of a priori conception of justice and equality and fraternity or something like that, um, what they wanted to do was, let's just look and see which human societies are the ones that people want to go to, which ones are the ones that they want to flee from, which ones are the ones where they're actually benefiting in some way, according to their own lights. And it turns out they found Smith, Hume, even people like Montesquieu, um, who was um, not part of the Scottish Enlightenment, um, but it was influ influential on it. What they found to their great joy was that it turns out a few principles actually do seem to cross across uh, cultures, societies, races, um, if we have a government that does these few things, it looks like that might really be all you need. And human beings have a roughly equal ability to improve their own situation if you just give them the chance. And a lot of the bad things that go on in the world, they thought, were um, not so much because we aren't helping people, but it's because of all the bad things we're doing to people. Um, so what you got from the Scottish Enlightenment was something like, the, uh, in political economy, what I think you get from medicine. What's the Hippocratic Oath in medicine? What do you do first? Do no harm. <laughs> That was, um, and that's a very different, it's, it's a much more, it's a much humbler view of the philosopher and the philosopher's mind that you get from Smith and the Scottish Enlightenment than you get from, say, Rousseau, who thought, no, I'm the smartest, literally the smartest person on earth, so therefore I can excogitate the proper principles that will hold for all time and all places. The, the Scots tended to be um, much more pragmatic about it. And when you get, um, so earlier was mentioned the, uh, the line in the, Declaration of Independence about the pursuit of happiness. That is an absolutely brilliant and brilliantly American flourish. We don't know what happiness for you will end up constituting, so we're not going to tell you. It's a hard, it's on you. You got to figure it out, but we're going to create the institutional structures in which you have the freedom and also the responsibility of figuring it out for yourself. That's very different conception. And, and it, quite frankly, I think it uh, entails a lot of trust in people. Very optimistic view. You're capable of figuring it out on your own. Maybe you're capable of more than you think you're capable of. Yes, we all have hardship, but we also all have a certain ability to figure things out on our own, and we don't need to look to Rousseau or to a great mind or to the great will or somebody else who can tell us what it is we need to do. You can do it on your own if you have the freedom and are held responsible at the same time. Well, thank you very much. Our next event is May 29th. Samuel Gregg of the Acton Institute speaking on Tocqueville, Novak, and the Challenge of Socialism. This concludes our event. Thanks again.